But for this particular thing, he captured what we, we, we're talking about in this country. He, he says that, and I think that's almost talking about this country, that egoism is the law of, of perspectives as it applies to feelings according to which what is closest to us appears to be large and weighty, right? Whatever is close to you is what is large and weighty, while size and weight decreases with distance from things, right? And here we're talking about things both in terms of time and in terms of space. So what this thing says is that for those of us in this room now, this is the most important place in the world today, right? right? And that's the, that's the concept. And the closest your children or your family, the most important thing to everything, right? This is almost a human tendency. This is how we think. But as we know, there are many things that are human that are not, they don't help you all the time, right? And this is probably one of it. So this is this something. When you hear this country or this country, think about it. It just says that the value you receive today is much more weighty than the same value if it's going to come to you in the future. So if I promise you a thousand dollars, and I say, I'll give you that thousand dollars today, or in five years time, which one will you prefer? What do you want it? You want to wait five years or you want it now? Now, now, now. Oh, so everybody wants it now. That means you are discounted. You know inside you that receiving that one thousand today is more valuable to you than waiting five years to get it, right? That's the only reason you said now, right? So, so that is an expression of this And there are many reasons you can use your one thousand dollars to do something now, right? To pay for your for your trip to to take this course and become a better early career scholar, right? You can do that, or you can go have fun. You go to people, right? And spend two weeks. Or you can invest and it will grow, right? If you buy, which is the fastest growing stock today, does anybody know? Yeah, so you buy Tesla or the stock and then who knows, in five years, your 1,000 will be half a million dollars. I'm dreaming here, okay? But that will get the point. So that is why we prefer to do this. So there are good reasons to do that. Now, when you put this into an economic model, what it says is that if you are going to get a constant flow of benefit through time from your fishery, constant, so this year I get a million, next year I get a million, up to say 100 years I get a million. In your economic analysis, the weight you put on that $1 million coming each year is depicted by this thing. If you discount by just 7%, that's what that is. So in our economic models, the value coming to somebody born 100 years from now who will need fish to eat is given this way, whilst my value, the fish I eat, is given that way. Is this fair? And you will say that is not fair. And that is what implicitly we do. And the consequence of this is that we want to front load, front load our benefits and back load our costs. Think of this uh, uh, climate change. Everybody will say, oh, we'll do something in 50 years, right? My generation, where will we should be? Nowhere will be 50 years. So I can make that promise, right? So, so that is exactly what we're doing. So this continent is very strong uh, concept. This will give you a bit, a bit of example. Just showing time here and the population of fish, depending on the discount rate. If you start with a low discount rate, some number, huh? say 2%, if we have discount rate 2%, with all the biology and all other economic uh, cost and uh, prices, if you just look at the discount, change the discount rate and make it a little bit higher to some medium range, this is the stock you will leave in the ocean. This is your standing biomass in the ocean. If you just change your discount rate, from something which is low to something which is high, that's what will happen. If you take it even lower, sorry, if you take it even lower. So this, the only, the only thing that changes this equilibrium biomass is the discovery. I'm not touching the biology, I'm not touching the other economic area. So this is powerful. If 
fight is so powerful that uh, we will we will we will use it to do some 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 work here. Uh, I'll show you. So what I'm going to do is to see or combine this information with other information to develop what we call an ecological economic indicator of fish vulnerability. We are looking at biology and economics because biologists usually check vulnerability using biology. But if you bring in the economics, it actually changes the picture a lot. So just uh, um, uh, something to note here. All that I'll say here, I'm looking at ecosystems without taking current management into consideration. So please watch that because the results I show may not be what you see in practice in certain areas. So take spatial analysis, so you see something. So that uh, therefore not tell me we do it better in Australia. I don't have your management in there, I'm just looking at uh, <laughs> Yes. All right. Okay. So here, Colin Clark, uh, who is quite a senior colleague, uh, Clark should be what, 85 years old now. He did two papers in, in the early 70s. How uh, I many were born then? No, we shouldn't go into that. In the 70s, Colin Clark. He's still writing papers and books, actually. It's amazing. And he came up with, with two papers and, and showed that if you take R, R is the intrinsic growth rate of your fish. That is the natural growth rate of your fish. And D is your discount rate of the country or the person doing the fishing. It shows that if the average cost of fish in the last unit of fish is less than the price per unit of that fish, then the necessary and sufficient conditions for overfishing to be the private resource owner. So if you are fisher uh, for, for to, to take up or to overfish, is that the discount rate is greater than the growth rate of the fish. Very simple but very powerful. So whenever you have a fish that grows slowly in a situation where the discount rate is higher than the growth rate. Tendencies to the fish. Yeah. Simple path for so. And then he goes on to say, in fact, if the growth rate, uh, if the growth rate, or if the discount rate is bigger than two times the growth rate, you can drive your fish to a station. And I think the title is what the economics of exploitation. And, and this was quite a uh, should the should the profession. And he did something here, which I thought I should mention to He published the same results in two journals. Okay? So you don't only really publish, you publish again. Have you heard that before? Yeah, because they're different audiences. And you got it into science. Of course, the technical the demands for science are different, right? And then you got it in the Journal of Political Economy, two really big. JPE is a top journal in economy. I don't need to tell you guys, right? You got them in there because they're two different audiences, really. Economists who read this will not go to science and vice versa. So you don't only publish, you republish different media. Get it in the newspaper, get it as a blog, get it into that, into a book chapter. It doesn't matter, just get it because if you want your message, you get it, right? That's why you're doing all this work. So, so I think you got a lot of attention. Okay? Now, so using these results, what me and William Chan did was to combine, and we went very simple. Uh, however, you told us indicators, you got to be simple. So we said, how can we quickly say something useful without too much work? <laughs> We're economists, right? That should be your goal. You do good work without too much work. <laughs> if we can achieve that, then you fly, you know, right? We, so, so we, we, we look at the whole of the ecology literature and what we decided was good enough to give us an indication of the ecology is actually to look at the life histories of fish. How did they grow? And we captured that by the intrinsic growth. If you know that about the fish, you know a lot. Right? And that's it. And then how are the economics? We said if you know about how people discount the future, you know a lot of economics. So these are two primary indicators that we then feed in to put 
produce a very simple indicator, which hopefully tells us something more. So, now, before I get to the indicator, the implication of Clive's results that I showed you is that a rational portfolio manager, a rational economic fisheries fisher, will actually cash out of the resource and invest the process elsewhere under certain conditions, and that is if your fish is more valuable in a bank than in the ocean, you take it out and put it in the bank. Is that crazy? That's crazy, but this is Russia. Huh? So if you have two, two portfolios, that's how you come to see fish and the stock of whatever, or, or investment, even in your education, say, okay, the fish grows every year 5%. The fish today and I put it in the bank, the bank will give me 10%. Ah, my fish in the bank grows two times of my fish in the ocean. What will you do? If you really have to make money, huh? what will you do? Priscilla, what will you do? <laughs> you keep the fish in the ocean. I can see on your feet because <laughs> your values are more than just money, right? It's just great. Yeah. There, there is that too. But that's, that's the point of this paper. And we say it's not just theory, these things are actually happening. With me and one of our students, uh, camera uh, and so on, we actually used this theory. We demonstrated that the emptying of the cord stocks of Newfoundland are actually economically rational. We use the money to pay lots of things. So yeah, I'm not advocating that, but that's what the theory says, right? <laughs> so and 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 the Norwegian Spring can be stocks. All right. So given this result, how can we develop a bioeconomic vulnerability in the fisheries? That is the challenge we give ourselves in the paper. So we went up, you can do a lot of mathematics to get to these results. If you take large results and, and you do all the gymnastics in mathematics, you easily find out that in the limit, the rate of growth of your fish stock is actually equals to the interest growth rate. The limit. Uh, they did lots of masturbations. So that's one. And then the second one is that, again, as you approach zero, the rate of growth of your fish is because you are this country. So you have the magical results that you need for our communicate. So we brought these two things together and, and came up with this. You know, this is your discount rate, this is your interest rate, growth rate. And then we calculate some theta, and that is it. And it gives you an idea of how vulnerable your fish stock is. Not only looking at the ecology, but also looking at the economics. Yeah, so that is our index now. Simple. So I meet all your criteria, all is all I do, right? Your simplicity. Now let's see how this turns out in real life. Yeah. All right. So putting life into the index because it looks so dry and boring. One man has delta over now. Right. But let's see how the data brings life into it. To be able to calculate that, you need to know what are the discount rates of countries. We're looking at this at the country level. You need to know the interesting growth rates. You need to know what catches you take. Many countries report their discount rates. Many of biologists have estimated uh, interest growth rates. So we looked at for all the data we have. And where there is no data, we found a model, right? Like the interest growth rate, there are models that have been developed and put data to calculate this way. So we have data for every commercial species, for every country, you know, in our database. And we go ahead and start doing this on just to give you some, uh, some ideas of the interesting growth rate of some fish species here in the database, orange roughy, we got normal like 2.5%, maybe it's a little lower. All these numbers are either supported by the literature or by our model, Pacific Granadia, stable fish. So these are just examples of some growth rate. Pacific heading, that's quite high, 23%. 
bit here. So that's the kind of fish you can, everything being a crop, you can go after it, right? Because uh, it grows fast. So then on the discount rates, we have country discount rates here. Look at Iceland. Iceland for a moment became like a developing country after the financial crash. Right? Yeah, interest rate went like crazy, so the discount rate followed it. And the, the UK seems to be the one with the lowest official discount rate that we know. Alright, so on this we did for all the countries, fishing countries, and put them in the, in the system. So this is uh, an example. This uh, East Coast of Canada, Newfoundland, yeah. and we just played around with this uh, index to see how it will come. And to be able to calculate this, we go station. So we take an area, we say which countries are fishing there, right? What are their discount rates? So we have the discount rate of Canada, of the US, and, and Iceland, is it? It's one of the Scandinavian countries, they confuse me, they all have this almost uh, different colors. Which one is it? Norway? Norway. Yeah, Norway. <laughs> so we get that. And then we, we say what fish species are in that area. How the what? That's the rate. And then we put all this into the big computer machine and we play this. So you can go half degree by half degree cells. That's the, the unit of uh, spatial calculation. And then you have something coming out. So, so for, for, for that part, this was uh, what we found. And if you look up there, the, the, the red areas are areas you need to watch. And the blue areas are, are not that bad. So to, to translate it, you know, John Bush said something from He said, I know that fish and humans can live, that can coexist peacefully. There's one group which is going around, a very funny one. I think the fish are people by with weapons to shoot. No. So, so actually, if you think it in that way, these are areas where the fish, ecology and economics are in conflict. So you have slow growing fish, high discovery countries. So you need to watch mm -hmm. those areas. And these are areas where, yeah, they can coexist actually. <laughs> So, so that's um, the, the, the purpose of this. So we do, we, we do some mapping. And this is a picture. If you just mapped out the intrinsic growth rate, this is what you will get. So if you just looked at the ecology, the biology, you will end up saying that these are the most vulnerable areas. And these are places that are fine, you know? Look at that. This is all good. Because they're just looking at the ecology of the fish. That tells you only half of the story, in fact, less than half of the story. So if you use your resources to protect these areas, that would be crazy, huh? Yeah? Because really there's not much fish in there. So, so that, that's what that's why I always talk about interdisciplinarity. If you look at this only from the ecology, you're gonna miss a lot. And it's the same with the economics. Look at it only from the economics. Now look at Brazil, my God. <laughs> if you look at it on the economics, this is where they should put all the resources to, to protect the system. Because these are the high discount rate fish in countries operating. And then you can go to sleep, right? And this is the real story is actually when you bring them together. So we did bring them together. So if you bring the ecology and the economics, you have a modified picture, right? And so you, you're beginning to really get a grasp of where the troubles are and where the troubles are not the high seas, right? And then suddenly you see West Africa is red. So and the fact that we have suddenly that grows fast is not enough to make it uh, because the economic pressure is high. So that is why and when I presented this, you see, the first time I did this revision, right? Because when I said that you can get it, it was it appeared in maps. Modern ecological progress schemes. So so this is and, and when I present this and then I, I took 
topology is associated with the regime, even this is not a complete picture. Our, the, the, the norms of the country, right? Our the social culture, and they are right. We are at least Okay? We are all fishes. Alright? Then you can do all sorts of things. If you look at all the, the mess of species, this is what you get. Naturally, you get more red, right? Because the mess of are slower on average than the lighting species. So, so it gets really scary here with it. Okay? So what can you do with this? What can you do with this? Our goal was actually to start developing a model that can be useful to managers. So if this is well done, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. We took our management, you have to put in management to that to modify. The right you see, the countries try to manage their species. So this is just the beginning, uh, what I consider to be a long road to developing a full-fledged bioeconomic vulnerability index that can be used in practical management and can quickly inform policy makers and managers about the most vulnerable parts of the ocean. That's it, to bring the people and the nature together. You have an idea. And provide information for effective spatial management, you know. Every, every management authority has very limited resources in the developing countries is even more so. So if you have small money, what do you do? You want to use it in the most effective way. And our hope is that this thing can help people to manage spatially and also your, your resources. Prioritize what to use their management resources. Any questions? Class is quiet. Is it a lot of economics here? I go too fast here, yeah, please. In the conservation risk index, is there any price signal in terms of the slow growing species being more valuable or any, anything like that? No, not, there, there's no price signals out there at the moment, you know. And that is a good point, right? That's why I say it's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to do here. You know, Again, if you have an idea, what you do, you get it out. You, you, you get it out in a form that can stimulate more action. So the price signals are not the subsidies. That's another one, right? Subsidies. Management, I already told you. So, so there is a lot more to do. That's why I'm not running around with this and telling managers to use it, right? <laughs> because there's something, okay? That's good. But it's a start, which I think is promising. You think otherwise? Right? And 
lady will ask you so, so how much can I save now? How much should I save now? Such that it can grow to hundred million dollars in the future if I invest it or save it in the bank and I'm giving some interest. Okay. So I'm going to be generous. Uh, you go to the central bank of the world and they promise you they will pay you 8%. Okay? 8%. Now, this is looks crazy, but this has happened in history. I think the average is probably 7%. So you are promised 8% each year into, into the future. Then I don't pass it on interest. And uh, your question is how much do you save today so that in 100 years time, this is the fun part, you will have 100 million dollars to donate to Ima. Right? So, how much would you need? 8% is an interest rate. I don't want you to think much. I don't just think about this quickly and, and then we take some dollars. And then I give you the results. That's the fun part. Okay? Don't do any calculations, Mr. Economics. Don't do it. Okay. So, just give me some guesses. How much will you need to save today at 8% interest rate? So that, did I say, did I say 100 years? Yeah, 300 years. <laughs> to make it a bit outrageous, 300 years, it will grow to 100 million dollars. How much do you need to save now? So take 300 years, not 100. 100 is too simple. Okay? How much? Somebody wants to give it a try. Send. All right, the send. Okay, it's really tight with this money, right? <laughs> How about you? You're going to say the send. Fifty dollars. Okay. Somebody else. Fifty dollars. One cent. Wow. Can you imagine the difference? Who else? Thank you so much. <laughs>